let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, and pray, and then uh, we will begin our uh, our topic this morning um, concerning our Revelation chapters four and five. Let's uh, let's pray. Our Lord, thank you so much um, for your grace. Um, I know we we pray that often here, but that that is the only thing we have, um, Lord. That uh, by the things that you have given to us, even your word, Lord, um, you have delivered to us. Uh, by your by your grace, um, it's shown us insight and wisdom into how to make wise choices concerning our lives, and as well as uh, looking at the future and seeing your your faithfulness all throughout human history. Um, we pray, God, uh, just for this time, Lord, uh, as we seek to understand your word even more clearly than we did the day before. That is our intent, um, so that it may uh, change our focus. And uh, give us clarity about not only the things that are present now, but also the things to come. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you due praise. For it's in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So um, we are now uh, past the Christmas season and heading into the new year. And with that, we will continue our discussion with Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Right? And hold on. Let me do this here because you had this all set up well and then I had to go mess it up. There we go. Um, we've been uh, looking at various questions. We haven't been going line by line through the text, but we kind of have. So it's it, we're kind of doing bo both and not at the same time. Um, um, and we're doing so by asking questions concerning the text, uh, things that some theologians have asked some things that I'm curious about, uh, perhaps maybe you're curious about, and we're trying to understand uh, this, this uh, scene here that's found within these two chapters of Revelation. We started off uh, by looking at is the rapture of the church between chapters three and four, right? And we concluded that, that that's not the case, right? As we've been reviewing the uh, just the scriptures and the text themselves, uh, there is no rapture between chapters three and four. Uh, we also explain the significance of metatelta, that is, uh, after these things or what occurs after these things. John uses this frequently in his discourse, and all it is is just a marker for us to just uh, when when we read it to show that he's transitioning from one seed to the next. That's all. Okay. And that's uh, significant, too, uh, in relation to our first question. Uh, who's the one speaking in John uh, to John in Revelation 4? One, we concluded based upon the text that this is none other than Christ himself. All right. It's based upon the details of the passage. Uh, why is this entire scene in chapters four and five? This was, uh, again, why is this scene even in this text? What's the purpose of it? And we discovered that the reason behind this particular scene is that it parallels with all the Old Testament passages concerning judgment, right? And that God is being consistent uh, before he lays out how he is going to judge the world, just like in the past when he talks about either judging Israel for their idolatry and things like that. Um, um, he uh, gives a very, very awesome scene to show that this is indeed God speaking. Now, I find this to be fascinating, and we'll look at this later on, is that most of these scenes that are connected have everything to do with idolatry. And it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, we have the same language as we see in the Old Testament, which is kind of fascinating. Um, who is on the throne in chapters four and five? We talked about that. There are some who believe that uh, Jesus is on the throne. There are some who believe that uh, Jesus, who is the father, who is the, uh, the spirit is on the throne. Uh, lots, of, lots of interesting uh, uh, explanations there. But we concluded that the one who's on the throne is the father himself. That And the one who is passing uh, the scroll to the lamb is the father. Okay. Who are the 24 elders? The 24 elders. No, no, no deeper than that, right? 
We looked at the function of elders, the functionality of them. Uh, we looked at some of the scenes and the context around there, and we concluded that there are just 24 elders. They don't represent anybody or any group. Okay? I think the most important thing is what they're doing. Okay? So now we're going to, uh, what is the purpose of the scroll? We'll talk about that this morning. And uh, who are the myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands? Okay. Um, again, we uh, uh, again. Who are the twenty-four elders? They're just twenty-four, and nothing more than that. So let's go ahead and continue with our questions. And again, the purpose of the scroll. Now, I'm not. This is kind of going to be broken up into two parts. Okay, uh, for the reasons being that the scroll has everything to do with chapter six as well. So we're not going to necessarily answer this question now, but what we are going to do is look at other people, specifically one specific individual who I find his answer to be quite fascinating. Uh, this morning, I want us to focus on the method of how we interpret and how we explain scripture. Method is very, very important. It is the important thing, okay? There are some individuals that use their theology to explain text. That's backwards. We shouldn't be doing that. We should always have a method, and that method that we employ should be used consistently, systematically, rationally, logically. And we're going to talk about that this morning. And we're going to focus on one particular one, specifically one that's been um, kind of in vogue now for uh, a, a minute. And that is what's known as the Christocentric theological hermeneutic or Christocentric theology. What do I mean by that? Um, Christocentric theology is a system. It's a theological system or, 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 even a, or even a method, we can even say that, that attempts to observe Christ, in some cases, even his death, burial and resurrection in every narrative of scripture, okay? That Christ is everywhere in the text, okay? Um, this could be problematic because there are some texts that don't talk about Christ at all, right? And yet individuals who use this view tend to observe Christ in every, every verse, every passage, okay? We can kind of hearken it to uh, this. So everybody has a source of authority. We talk about this here a lot, often at Beth Haven, that there is a there is a authoritative source that we answer concerning questions about life, life in general. This same source of authority, in some respects, we use to interpret the text. If we have a source of authority that assumes that Christ is in every text, we will open up our Bibles, we will read a passage, and we will try to find Christ in the text, even when it doesn't say it is, or it's not about him. Does that make sense? So, I introduce you to a gentleman by the name of James Holbrook, okay? James Holbrook uh, is a, a, a teacher, a, a theologian, and I could recall uh, one time that uh, when I was at my, the former church before we came here, I was teaching on the book of Revelation. We were in chapter four, and, um, and, and I was teaching uh, essentially uh, that the scroll, uh, which I'll give you my thesis statement later on, but I basically was teaching about the same thing about the purpose of the scroll. And my man got hot under the collar. Oh my gosh, he was so hot. I mean, he was starting to do this type of stuff, getting around, starting to pace the room. And so uh, I came up and we had a lengthy discussion concerning the purpose of the scroll in Revelation. And so the next week he came back and he had a paper stapled and he put it on the lector. And he said, I want you to read this right here. This is my this is my argument right here. OK, now he didn't write it, um, but he's, he agreed with with the person on the page. This person was James Holbrook. 
right? So I read it and I said, you know what? This would be a good lesson to teach. So we're gonna do that this morning. This is James Holbrook's thesis statement concerning the book of Revelation and the purpose of the scroll. This book, that is specifically this chapter, but Revelation as a whole, contains the terms for redemption for the earth. This is the whole, this is his whole thesis statement for the book of Revelation, that the earth has to be redeemed. Okay. The main word that James Holbrook uses for his thesis is redemption. Uh, you could find it all over the place in his right in, in the, pa the paper that was given to me. Okay. So let's take a look at some of the uh, some of the points that he makes concerning his uh, book itself, uh, the book of Revelation. Um, he connects three different books, cross references them. OK, concerning this chapter, the redemption of the earth and various places in the Old Testament. Okay. One, uh, one such place he looks at is the book of Ruth. OK, he talks about the uh, the church as the as the bride of Christ, the wife of Christ. And he uses the book of Ruth as an example of this. As a matter of fact, uh, if you uh, turn to Ruth chapter four, verses seven and eight, he uses this text to explain uh, a particular point that he makes concerning uh, what Christ has done for the church. In Ruth chapter four, verse seven, and 12, he details this. Uh, now, this was the custom in the former times of Israel concerning the kinsman redemption and the transfer of property. To confirm the matter, a man removed his sandal and gave it to his fellow countrymen. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. So the Redeemer said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself. And so he removed his sandal. This was the means by which he was purchasing land. They would usually walk around the land and then hand a sandal over to him. That was kind of the deed that was done uh, during the time of Israel. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have acquired all that was for Elmelech and that, and, and that was for Kilon and Palon and the hand of Naomi. Verse 10. And also Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Milan. I have acquired as a wife to raise up the name of the dead over his inheritance so that the name of the dead may not be cut off from the relatives and from the gate of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. Verse 11, and all the people who were at the gate and the elders uh, said, we are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman coming into your house as Rachel and Leah, again, a common prayer of Israel, who together built the house of Israel. May you have strength in Ephrath and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And then last verse 12, and may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah of the offspring that Yahweh will give to you from this young woman. Very, very good prayer. James Holbrook comments concerning uh, the book of Ruth in relation to Revelation. Remember, he is he is viewing this uh, from he, he cracked open Revelation looked at this passage and now is using Ruth to interpret this passage, okay? He says this, James Holbrook writes, the husband's brother was to take the widow as his wife and raise his children in his dead brother's name so that his family name and inheritance would not die out. This has everything to do with Jesus being, according to James Holbrook, as the kinsman redeemer, Right. Who is redeeming uh, Ruth and 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 the land and all this stuff. Right. So according to James Holbrook. This is the redemption of a kinsman that a kinsman needs to redeem his people and the land. Okay. The second uh, verse that uh, he kind of focuses on is found in the book of Leviticus. 
And this is uh, concerning the slave. Okay. If you would turn to Leviticus chapter 25. We are going uh, to read verses 47 to 48. And then we'll be going into uh, uh, the book of Jeremiah here, too. So if an alien or a temporary resident, again, concerning uh, the manner and customs of Israel, if you are uh, and, if the, if, and if the alien or the temporary resident who are with you are prosper, but your countryman who is with him becomes poor and he is sold to an alien, a temporary resident who is with you, or to a descendant of an alien's clan after he is sold, redemption shall be for him. One of his brothers may redeem him, right? Hold on, let's go back to, let's stay on Leviticus for just a second. Okay? So, so if an alien or a person who is living in the land temporarily, in the land of Israel, comes to you and they prosper, Right, and he's sold as an alien that or a temporary resident who's with you, that they can be bought back, um, uh, or one of his brothers may basically purchase him back. This is to underscore again the purpose of the slave being brought back and not being a slave anymore. In the case of James Holbrook and him using this, uh, this, uh, uh, um, uh using Leviticus as a grid to interpret Revelation 4, he's essentially saying that uh, those who were under the, or under the devil were slaves to him. And Christ needed to redeem uh, that person from slavery. That's his, that's, his, that's his argument. And he's using Leviticus 25, verses 47 and 48 to make this claim. In Jeremiah 32, chapter 32, we read this, this little duty. Verses 9 to 12. James Holbrook uh, uses this verse to describe how the land will be brought will be brought back. He goes, and I brought from the field of Hanamel, the son of my uncle, who was at Ananon, and I weighed out to him the money, 17 silver shekels, and I signed on the letter and sealed it. And I called witnesses as witnesses, and I weighed out the money on a set of scales. Okay. Then I took the deed of purchase the sealed copy containing the commandments and the rules together with the one that was open. So you had a, a couple of scrolls here. One of them was the deed, right? And, uh, and, and, and within that deed was a sealed copy containing all the ordinances and the rules and things like that uh, concerning the land that's being purchased. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Mashiach, in the presence of Hanamel the son of my uncle, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, in the presence of the Judeans who were sitting in the courtyard of the guard. So this is all official business, right? So let's look at the explanation according to uh, Mr. Holbrook here. He says, uh, when a man fell into debt and lost his property or land, he was taken to the judges and a document was prepared showing that his land had passed on to pay his debt. The change was not permanent. And in the year and in the year of Jubilee, when that came, the land was to be returned to its original owner. No problems there. One was left open in the temple to be read. The other was rolled up and sealed with seven seals and kept in a temple only to be brought to when a kinsman redeemer worthy and able was found. Do you see the connection? He's using the culture to describe what's going on with Revelation. The kinsman will go to the temple and show he was willing to pay. The sealed scroll was brought forth. The property was returned to its original owner 
and the seals torn open, showing that the land was free of debt and returned to its original owner. So when uh, the father is giving the deed, the scroll, to his to the lamb, it's basically saying that Jesus has rights to claim this land. That's what he's doing. And he's doing it in the presence of the elders. He's doing it in the presence of the angels. This is all uh, signifying the importance of this event that the father hand, the son, the scroll, the deed of purchase so that he can rule the earth. That's, that's, that's the whole goal of the scroll, according to James Holbrook. Right? In Jewish law, the scroll had to do with the redemption of the land only. So when we talk about that should be Jeremiah, the book. Of, so when we talk about uh, uh, the purpose of the scroll, we have the wife, the book of Ruth in Revelation chapter four, verses seven and 12. That is the that is uh, the church. Jesus is the one who uh, redeemed the church according to him in Revelation chapter one, verse five. It says this. John to the, I'll start at verse four, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you in peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood, right? That release, according to James Holbrook, is the redemption of, from a kin of a kinsman to the slave, okay. Uh, he parallels First John chapter three verse two. I will start at verse one. It says, "See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God, and such we are." For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appeared, we will be like him for we because we will see him, excuse me, just as he is. In other words, uh, we will be redeemed uh, by we are redeemed by Christ. And one day we will be completely free. Right. That Christ has bought the slave and made him essentially a son, okay? The last thing according to James Holbrook that needs to be redeemed is the land, okay? And of course, uh, he references Jeremiah, which we just looked at, and the earth has not been redeemed yet, okay? But it will be according to James Holbrook. So Christ alone meets the requirements for a kinsman redeemer, okay? according to James Holbrook. To Satan will not relinquish the earth. Remember, uh, according to James, he, he owns the earth, right? He owns the deed. He owns the title, right? Um, so that the judgments show the process by which he is to, to release the world. So the judgments that are explicated, right, uh, is basically... Uh, uh, God, Jesus going, you know, you, yeah, I'm going to take back this land, right? I'm coming in. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the repo man, right? He's, uh, he's foreclosing on the house. So he's, he's going to, he's going to buy it, right? That's, that's the idea. It means 24 elders, nor there's no specificity of the division of the elders. So he agrees with us there. Uh, Christ alone is worthy. He must be a relative, according to James Holbrook, Revelation 22, verse 16. He must be willing. That's John 10, uh, verses 17 and 18. Now, just as an aside, I'm not making a case for this. Okay. So I don't want you coming up to me or Dr. Smith, do you believe in it? I'm not making a case for this. Okay. I'm just showing you what James Holbrook believes, and we're using it as an example to show that method matters. That's, that's all we're doing, okay? So he must be a relative, he must be willing, John 10, verses 17 to 18, he must be able, 
uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, uh, which is what Mr. Holbrook quotes. According to James Holbrook, the book of Revelation is a book of redemption. Christ buys back the earth, taking it from Satan, Satan who does not want to let it go. He's holding on. And Christ is going to take it and rip it out from his hands. Right. Now, it would be it'd be cool for us to know um, in a diagram what this looks like. How one would read this um, with the Christocentric view. OK. So if you can see here, uh, this is the fall, right? Uh, this is Genesis 3 here. And then you have the Old Covenant, right? This is all, all the Old Testament, right? According to how uh, this goes. And then you have the cross. And then the New Covenant, you know something here? There's something missing here. Yeah, interesting. So some of the features that are found in the crystal centric theory is all messianic promises are fulfilled in Christ. They take uh, uh, that verse, um, 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 in Christ things are not no or yes, in Christ all things are yes. They take that and they over they they over the, theologicalize it. Okay, to say, oh well, that means uh, if if all promises are yes in Christ, then that means even the promises that are reserved for Israel are ours. Okay. All God's activity centers in Christ. All of his activity, all of his deeds, even the things that are, don't mention Christ explicitly, those things are centered in Christ. And then God continues to act in grace by the reality of Christ. Okay, so all of these, all of these things here, notice you have old covenant, you have the cross, new covenant, and then uh, and then the second coming right after that, and then new heavens and new earth. Boom. Notice there's something missing here. Okay. James Holbrook has adopted a Christocentric theological view. And this view, again, is in, is coloring the way that he observes the text, the way that he observes Revelation. Well, let's take a look at, uh, uh, again, the redemption argument. Um, actually, let's, yeah, let's take a look at some counter arguments. I, now, now it's time to kind of pick this thing apart here. So in Ruth chapter four, verse seven and eight, there is a deal that is mentioned, okay? However, if you notice the details of the passage, a scroll is not mentioned, but a sandal is mentioned. Let's take a look at Ruth chapter four, verses seven and eight again, and, uh, and kind of walk through this here. Now, this was the custom in former times of Israel concerning the Kimson Redeemer and transfer of property. To confirm a matter, a man removed his sandal and gave it to his fellow countrymen. Uh, um, the author of Ruth is just detailing this is the custom that was done to just transfer land. Was they would walk around and then hand a sandal to somebody. Hey, it's yours. Okay? No scroll is mentioned in this text. Now, the last time I checked, a sandal and a scroll were two different things. Unless, of course... Maybe I need new glasses or something. I don't know. But 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 the sandal is not a scroll. So this can't be this can't be interpreted as that. What about Leviticus 25 uh, verses 25 to 47? Well, again, a, a scroll is not mentioned at all in that text either. Let's take a look at Leviticus 25, 47 to 50 once again and kind of read through it here. And if the alien or the temporary resident who are with you prosper, but your countryman who is with you becomes poor and he's sold to an alien, a temporary resident who is with you or to a descendant of an alien's clan, after he is sold, redemption shall be for him. One of his brothers may redeem him. Or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. 
or one of his close relatives from his clan may redeem him, or if he prospers, he may redeem himself. Again, there's, there's actually, let's keep reading just for a second. Um, and he shall calculate with his buyer the number of years of his selling himself until the jubilee. And the value of his selling shall be according to the number of years. It shall be like it shall be with him like a hired worker's day. So they they ca they calculate the year of jubilee minus that, and whatever uh, uh, years of jubilee that comes up, they have to work. If it's you know if it's ten years before then, then they have to work ten. If it's twenty, then they have to work twenty. So on and so forth, right? But there's no mention of a scroll here. No mention of a scroll. No mention of a, a procession. No, nothing. Nothing. Nothing, right? So that can't be it. How about Jeremiah 32, verses 9 to 12? Well, it's interesting. A scroll is mentioned. As a matter of fact, the word deed in the Hebrew text is literally scroll. That's, that's, that's what it is. A scroll is mentioned there, right? Oh, no. Whatever will we do? However, the purpose of the scroll is stated in the text itself, if we read on. Let's take a look at uh, Jeremiah 32, verses 9 to 10. And then we'll look at 36 to 41. Okay? Jeremiah 32, verses 9 to 10. And I bought a field from Hanamel, the son of my uncle, who was an Ananoth. I waited to him the money, 17 silver shekels. And I signed on the letter and sealed it. I called witnesses as witnesses, and I weighed out the money on a set of scales. Right? We already read this. And then I took the deed of purchase, the scroll of the purchase, and sealed the sealed copy containing the commandments and the rules together with one that was open. Now let's jump uh, down to verse 12. Again, I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of uh, Nerah, the son of Messiah, the son of Hanamel, you know, so on and so forth. Let's now let's jump to uh, to verse 36. I'm sorry, verse 37 and 38. Look, I'm going to gather from all of the lands to which I driven them in my anger and my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them back to this place and I will cause them to dwell in safety and they will be for me a people and I will be for them God. And I will give them one heart and one way to revere me forever for the good to, and for good to them and to their children after them. And I will make with them an everlasting covenant and I will not turn. I will not turn away from them. My doing good to them and my reverence I will put in their hearts so they will not turn aside from me. Verse 41. And I will rejoice over them to do good to them. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and with all my inner self. So the purpose of the scroll in Jeremiah was to affirm the promise of God that Israel will be brought back to the land that they were going to be dispossessed out of. That's the point. There is a scroll mentioned, but it's not about us as a church. It's about Israel and how God will make his promise good to them by bringing them back into the land that he is going to dispossess them out of because of their idolatry. So I guess I'm wondering, since it is about redeeming the land, but it ain't about us though, right? Closing up here, strengths and weaknesses. First of all, uh, the interpreter attempts to connect the, the re revelation to Old Testament text. I, I like that. I think it's good to do that. OK, uh, but there's a problem, though, with his with his doing that. The problem is, is that he's working from a Christological view. And so that's guiding not only the explanation, but that's also guiding the cross referencing, too. He can't get around that. He attempts to acknowledge the culture in light of revelation. That that is indeed true. We will take a look at that. Uh, as the, the deeper that we go, as a matter of fact, we've already seen this in the first two chapters, right? Where Jesus uses the culture to describe certain things, right? So that's, that is indeed a strength. 
It recognizes the redemptive aspect of the book of Revelation. Yes, there is a redemptive aspect to it, but it's not about us, though. As a matter of fact, the more that I study the book of Revelation, the more I am convinced that the church is not even in it at all. We kind of show up at the end, kind of, but not really. Okay? This is really about what's going on in that particular time period. A limitation is the interpreter does not work with the context. Have you noticed I haven't mentioned anything. I, for this whole time, I have not talked about Revelation 5. This whole time. We talked about other texts, but we haven't worked with the text itself. That's very important. If we're going to assert something about Revelation 5, we need to look at the language and the context within that chapter. That has to be important. Another limitation is that he doesn't deserve the details in the other passages he uses for cross-references, sandals and scrolls, uh, scrolls in connection with the land of Israel. I mean, he's not even, that's, to be honest, that's, that's biblically lazy. Nothing against Mr. Holbrook. I do not know this gentleman, but that's lazy. Let's look at some conclusions here. The interpreter att attempts to uh, connect Revelation to the Old Testament. That's good. He attempts to recognize the culture. He attempts, uh, he recognizes the redemptive aspect. Um, he does not work with the text and that he does not observe the details. The book of Revelation itself is a book of prophecy, and it should be looked at like that. Not apocalyptic, not symbolic. As a matter of fact, the symbols and things that are within the book of Revelation are detailed specifically. And again, we will look at those briefly. I have not answered the question yet, what is the purpose of the scroll? We will talk about that uh, in the next couple of weeks. But I just wanted to lay the groundwork that if we are doing this, we should be doing this. That we should always be looking at the at the language. We also we always should be looking at the grammar, and we should be doing it consistently, right? Always looking at the intent of the author and what he wants to and what he wants to communicate to the audience, right? And if we do that, a lot of the assumptions that we make about Revelation, I'm convinced, will be cleared up like that because we are working with the text right okay we are finished i actually finished early okay made up for all the lost time i didn't <laughs> let's uh let's go ahead and pray and then uh we will uh we will end our uh our lesson here for this morning lord we thank you so much that you have given your word to us. And we thank you, Lord, that you've also given us the method in your word so that we may be able to read it rightly, to take what you say very plainly, to take what you say in a normal sense. If we, if we do our due diligence and apply that consistently, we may have to work to understand what you had communicated to the authors, but it's not impossible to know. And we thank you, Lord, for that. I pray, Lord, um, as just the body uh, of this local fellowship, that we would continue to uh, reinforce ourselves that, that method matters. The way that we read the text matters because we could possibly, if we don't read it rightly, we could make um, conclusions about the text that are not there. And that's, that's, that's a challenge. It's a problem. Um, we thank you so much, Lord, for your plain and simple word. And we pray, Lord, that we would continue to read it and ingest it and receive more clarity from it so that we may know you more 
um, than we did the day before. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you due praise. For it's in your son's name. Amen.